tonight we are moving in a slightly different direction away from a full moon because tonight we have something special in our sky we have something special that is appearing it's Mars how many of you have seen it it's big it's red and it's gorgeous every two years it comes close to earth and then we also have Jupiter in our sky tonight so I asked one of our research astronomers dr. Ruth Murray Clay she's a Smithsonian astrophysicist a Harvard lecturer and she's also a member of the Institute for theory and computation here at Harvard she comes to us from Berkeley with her PhD and she studies the evolution of atmospheres and planetary systems in outer space later be sure and ask her about Kepler 186 F the new planet discovered today with an atmosphere on it so without further ado I'd like to introduce our speaker Dr. Ruth Mary Clay Thank you for coming. Am I sounding loud enough? Yes. Fantastic. Today you're going to hear, as you heard already, about Mars and Jupiter. And what I'm going to be telling you about is how these planets came to be the very different planets that they are today. So before we can say why they're very different, first we have to understand in what way they're very different. Um, so let's start with this image. This is a picture of the sky in a very dark, very clear place, unlike Boston. <laughs> you can see down in the bottom right here um, is Orion's belt. And up here, uh, near the middle, is a bright dot. It looks a little red, and that's Mars. <coughs> Planets are some of the brightest objects that we can see in the night sky. Venus uh, is the winner. It's the brightest. Um, but coming in in second place are Mars and Jupiter. When they're at their brightest, um, they can actually be roughly equal in brightness. Right now, Mars is closer to us, so it looks brighter in the sky if the clouds cooperate. So, uh, um, so if we look at these planets, the first question that I have is, there are eight planets in our solar system. Why are these three the brightest ones? Does anyone have any ideas? Size, size, that's a fantastic answer. Which, one is, which ones are the biggest? Jupiter. Jupiter, Jupiter's the biggest one. All right, what's, what's another reason? Proximity. Proximity, fantastic. If you're closer, you're brighter. If you're bigger, you're brighter. So let's be a little more specific. Um, here's a diagram of uh, the inner solar system. Here I've put the distances of the orbits of the planets from the sun. Um, to scale. The sizes of the Sun and the planets are of course not to scale. If I tried to make those correct, the Sun would be tiny and you couldn't even see any of the planets. So I've just made them all bigger than they should be. Um, here we have Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and Jupiter. So we said that Venus and Mars um, are bright. Jupiter is bright. Well, These are bright because they're close and Jupiter is bright because it's big. So if we want to put these planets next to each other, they should look like this. Um, Mars is tiny. <coughs> Jupiter is its big cousin. And we can, in fact, fit 20 Marses across the surface of Jupiter. Now, if you had a big cousin and you could fit 20 U's across the surface of your cousin, it would be the Stay Puft Marshmallow <laughs> Man. <laughs> so they're very different in size. All right. Now, if you wanted to fill Jupiter with Marses, you'd have to put 3,000 of them inside. Um, and if you had 3,000 cousins, well, they might be uh, the 3,000 strong on the, on the cover of, of the current Sports Illustrated. All right. There. All right. So, in addition to being different sizes, uh, Mars and Jupiter are very different in, in what they're actually made of. So, let's take a look at that for a moment. Here's Mars um, spinning around. It's mostly rock. It looks red because its surface is covered essentially with rust. It has about uh, you know, twice as much iron in the surface material as we have on Earth. So that iron uh, rusts and it looks red. 
And it has a very thin atmosphere. It's mostly made of carbon dioxide. That's the part you see up on top here. And that atmosphere is 0.000003% of the mass of the planet. It's very tenuous. Um, the atmosphere of Earth is about a one millionth of the mass of our planet. If we look at Jupiter, uh, the situation is very different. Jupiter is essentially entirely its atmosphere. It's a ball of gas that's, uh, that's mostly hydrogen and helium, and at least 95% of the mass in this thing is atmosphere. So instead of it being very tenuous, it's the whole thing. You know, and when we look at the surface of Jupiter, you can see some of the consequences of that. If you look at uh, the clouds on this planet, you can actually see them moving in opposite directions and turbulent motions here that are crossing the whole planet. So not, this isn't the surface of the planet. These are just big cloud formations. We can zoom in on uh, the red spot here spinning around. It's a giant storm that's lasted for hundreds of years. And that's red too. But again, we're not seeing a surface that's rusting now. Um, instead, um, we're seeing gas that's made of something different than the gas nearby. And actually, exactly what's causing the red color in the great red spot is deb still debated. But, um, but we think that what's happening is the storm is basically lifting up gas from underneath it, which is then irradiated by high energy light from the sun, and that turns red, like organic uh, compounds, probably. All right. So why are they so different? And this is what I'd uh, really like to talk to you about today. Um, I'm a theorist. I work on how planetary systems form and evolve. Um, that's what I like to do. And, uh, and the difference between these planets is actually um, very important. It's important for our understanding not only of our own solar system, but also of the many planets that we're now finding around other stars. OK, so before I go into why they're different, quick question. Which one of these planets is Earth more like? Mars, Mars, of course, right. That's why you see movies of people walking around colonizing Mars. I've never seen a movie of someone colonizing Jupiter. <laughs> All right, so Earth is similar to Mars. It's, it's about twice as big. All right, so if we under want to understand why these planets are so different, first we have to figure out where did they come from. And the way to start thinking about where they came from is to, to think about um, where the sun came from. Planet formation is essentially a consequence of star formation. The vast majority of the mass in our solar system is in our star. And the planets are really just the leftover debris from the formation of the sun. So this is the Orion Nebula. It's a famous star forming region imaged with the Hubble Space Telescope. And these little insets here are locations where stars and probably planetary systems are forming. And we can understand that a little bit. If we take one of those little regions um, and look at, you know, this is another star forming cloud. This one's a little less dramatic, so maybe it's a little bit easier to understand. This is a dark clump of gas and dust that's marginally unstable to its own gravity. So it's about to collapse in on itself. We can actually measure that it's collapsing in on itself by looking at stars through the edges of this cloud. And you can see that they're actually looking red, very similar to the red that we just saw, and for actually basically the same reason. And what's happening to this is it's collapsing. And as it collapses, it has a little bit of rotation. So it starts spinning up, just like a figure skater when she pulls in her arms, starts spinning faster. And when you have a bit of gas that's collapsing and it starts spinning faster, two things happen. Gas on the bottom and on the top, they can just fall down into the middle. But if you're around the outside spinning around, it's like you're in your car, you take a quick turn and you get pushed to the outside. Um, and so that gas can't actually collapse as effectively. And what you end up with is a star forming in the middle and it's surrounded by a disk. This is the same reason why if you take a bit of pizza dough and throw it up in the air, it, it ends up flat. Okay, So now we have a forming star. It's, it's receiving you know, material from the cloud it's forming out of. 
Near the star, your disk is full of gas and dust. And I really mean dust, like little solid stuff. You know, maybe you can't really see, or you can see uh, sunlight, you know, uh, sparkling off the dust if you look at it from the right angle. And if you look out farther in the disk, it gets cold, and now you can have gas, dust, and also ice. And this is where planets form. So most of the material goes through the disk and onto the star, but a little bit is left over. And we can use that to form planets. Now here are some images from Hubble of actual disks around young forming stars. So they're really there, we can see them. And here's an artist's conception. Hopefully someday we'll have a picture this nice. Um, of a star with the disk around it. Now in that disk, um, what happens? Well, here's a, uh, here's a video. This is an artist's conception again of, um, of what I basically just told you. We're starting with a, uh, a star forming, just big diffuse cloud of gas and dust. And right in the middle there, you can see that a little piece of it has started to collapse and it's spinning. And as we zoom in, we'll start to see a protoplanetary disk. We'll see a star in the middle, and we'll start to see some planets forming out of that disk. So we're starting to get one up here, and over there. They're starting to grow. Now, if we zoomed in and tried to look in at what was really happening inside of those clumps, then what we would find, I'll let this finish. Yeah. Now, I made this artist's conception, so you can see it's much less beautiful <laughs> than the previous one. <laughs> now you have a star, and you have your disk. And if you look at a little bit of it, it has dust inside. And those little bits of dust collide together, and they start growing. And eventually they grow and now they're little pebbles. And then they grow some more and they become boulders. And you know, they grow more and now they're the size of Boston. And eventually they grow and they're the size of the Earth. And you know, usually when I try to think about you know, large scales in astronomy, I try to think of, well, what's a, you know, what's a relatable analogy that we can make, like the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man? But for this, um, it's hard to do because you know, the reality is the analogy. You, you know what a tiny piece of dust is. You have some sense of how big the Earth is. That's a lot of growth. <laughs> it's not a, not a minor thing to go from the one to the, to the other. And so it actually takes quite a bit of time for this to happen. So here's another artist's conception. You have a star in the middle. Um, a rock grows and grows in the young disk. And if it can grow big enough, it can, if it can grow massive enough while there's still gas around, then what it can do is it can actually accrete with its gravity all of the gas that's in its disk and become a gas giant planet. And how big does it have to be? Well, it has to be a little bigger than the Earth, maybe 10 times the mass of the Earth. So what you can think of this as saying is that, you know, Mars and Earth well, they tried to grow big enough to get all that gas, but we were just the failures. <laughs> Jupiter got it all, and we, we missed out. All right. OK, so, so what determines whether a planet has the time to grow big enough to become a gas giant, or uh, flames out and ends up uh, like Earth or Mars? Well, there are a few things. Um, one thing is actually where it's located compared to the star. So here's this diagram again. Um, the Mercury goes around the sun in about a fifth of a year. You go out, Venus takes half a year. Um, Earth takes a year, by definition. Uh, Mars takes two years. Jupiter, 12 years. If you go all the way out to Neptune, it's 160 years. The point is, the farther you go from the sun, the longer it takes. And the faster you can go around the sun, the more quickly you can collide with other material. So the point is here is that it's, it's easier to grow if you're closer to the sun. So all other things being equal, the closest planet should be the biggest. But there's kind of a problem with that. That's not the way things are in our solar system, so all other things must not be equal. 
To understand that, we can go back to this uh, diagram here. You can see that if you go far away from the sun, now you have more material to work with. You have ice available. And that ice also might make it easier to actually stick when you collide. So now you, have more, you just have more to work with. And you also have more just because the disk is bigger at those larger distances. All right. So why are Mars and Jupiter different? Here are the pieces of the puzzle. Gas disks left over from star formation last a limited amount of time. Rocky planets grow from dust and then rocks that collide and combine within the disk. And the gravity of large rocky planets can attract huge amounts of gas. So if we put this all together, we find that rocky planets that grow massive quickly turn into gas giants. And we can, we can conclude this discussion with the paradigm for why planets, planetary systems should look the way they do as it was known before exoplanets. So exoplanets are planets discovered around other stars. We now know about thousands of them. 20 years ago, we knew about zero of them. And so this paradigm was based entirely on the solar system. And here it is. We have all the pieces. Inside here, there's only a puny amount of stuff, so you can't grow very big. You end up with Earth or Mars. This is all not to scale, of course. This is just a diagram. You go out farther in the disk, and this green means now you have ice to work with. So now you have more material to work with. You can grow bigger, and you can accrete a giant atmosphere, become a gas giant like Jupiter. And then if you go even farther out to Neptune and Uranus, Neptune and Uranus, only about 10% of their atmospheres are, um, of their mass is in their atmospheres. We often like to think about Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune all as the giant planets in our solar system. But our ice giants, Uranus and Neptune, are actually quite different. They're not almost entirely atmosphere. They're only about 10%. And the idea was that, well, it just took them so long to grow that um, the gas that they had available to accrete was gone by the time they got big enough to accrete it. They only got the dregs, a little bit that was left over. OK. So this is what we knew before exoplanets. And as with many theories that are made based on samples of one, <laughs> when we got some more information, there was a little bit of a problem. OK, so let me, uh, let me explain what's going on here. Here's a plot. Um, I'm going to show two samples of planets that we have now discovered around other stars. These are known as radial velocity planets. Uh, what that means is they're discovered um, by looking at the wobble of the star that they're orbiting around. And I can explain that in more detail uh, later for anyone who's interested. Um, but here we have the mass of the planet in Jupiter masses. So one is the mass of Jupiter. Um, 0 0.003 here is the mass of Earth. And that's Neptune in the middle. And here is orbital distance. And this is an astronomical unit. An astronomical unit is the distance between the Earth and the Sun. So Earth is at one astronomical unit by definition. So here's where the Earth is on this diagram. Down here, we can't see anything yet with radial velocities. So this is empty just because it, you know, our detectors aren't good enough to see planets there yet. But what we can see is look at that Jupiter line. Here's the distance between the Earth and uh, the Sun. You know, Jupiter's out here. All the Jupiters were supposed to be out here. But look, they're all the way in to the star. And they're actually so close that this is, these ones here, they're known as hot Jupiters, they're only 10 stellar radii away from the Sun. So they're being baked. Um, this was entirely unexpected. All right, so that's the Jupiters. What about, um, what about terrestrial planets? What about the Earth and the Mars, and, and Marses? Well, here's a second set of planets that have now been discovered. These, are, these were discovered by the, the Kepler, NASA's Kepler satellite um, by looking for the dips when the planets pass in front of their host stars. Um, this plot is in orbital period, so this is, that's another way of saying the planet's a year. So, and this is 100 days, you know, our year is 365 days. So Earth is, yeah, 
here. Um, and this is uh, measured in the radius of the planet. In this case, the units are, are Earth radii. It's radius because the radius tells you um, how much light is blocked when the planet passes in front. And so we again have Jupiter, Neptune, and Earth. These are the ones we can't see. And here are the terrestrial planets. And they're everywhere we can see too. So we had this great idea about why the solar system looks the way it does and where all the planets should be. And instead, all of the different planets are everywhere. <laughs> all right, so does that mean we need to throw all of the ideas I, I, I just told you about out the window? Well, no, or all I wouldn't have wasted your time with it. Um, but, uh, but we need to add something important. Does anyone have any, any thoughts about what that might be? Just yell it, yell it out. Mass. mass. Um, that's a good idea, but see, we have all of these masses here, and at every mass, all the planets are everywhere where we can see. Gravity. Gravity. Could you, uh, could you tell me what you mean by that? No. <laughs> no? You're right. You're right. But we need to be a little more specific. They're light years away. They're light years away. Okay. So they're... They are, uh, so just to follow, they are light years away. In fact, every star that you see on the sky, point at one, there are planets around it, almost certainly. So um, mass of the stars, that's true. The planetary systems around stars of different masses look different. But actually, most of these are around sun-like stars. This, it just happens to be the case that the, this mission targeted stars like the sun. Orbits disrupted by other objects? Yes, orbits disrupted by other objects. To, uh, by gravity. And just generally, planets move from where they are born. Um, in retrospect, this is actually quite obvious, but before we knew about it, it wasn't obvious, as with many things in science. So there are actually a couple of ways that um, you can move planets around from where they were born. So movement. Um, here we have a, a simulation of a planet forming in that gas disk we talked about, and the gas is actually pushing it around um, much closer to the star than it started. So that might be how some of those hot Jupiters started far away and ended up close to their stars. Um, and uh, as was suggested, planets can actually interact with other objects in their system. So here we have a system with three planets orbiting the star, and you're going to see that the outer two end up getting too close to each other, and their gravity causes them to interact, and one of them will actually be entirely lost from this system. There it goes, and the other two are left on very different orbits than they started on. So it turns out there are actually a lot of ways that planetary systems can change the way they look after their planets are formed. Um, and one of the things that I think is really fun about this is that in the same 20-year period where we found other planets around other stars, we've actually learned that the planets in our own solar system probably moved from where they formed. So the story I told isn't even good for us. <laughs> it's kind of good, but it's, it's not good enough. Okay, so well, how do we know that? Well, in the same 20 years, um, the Kuiper Belt was discovered. So here I'm going to just orient you to this plot. Um, these uh, four circles here are the outer planets. There's Jupiter in the middle, uh, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And um, those blue dots in the middle are the asteroids that we know in the asteroid belt. And the red dots on the outside are the Kuiper Belt. And um, you know about the Kuiper Belt because it's why Pluto was demoted. Right. It's okay, Pluto. Well, I'm not a planet, but, um, but I have someone better who you can trust more that, to tell you that it's okay. And that's Ceres. Um, What's Ceres? It's an asteroid. It's the biggest asteroid in the asteroid belt. And Ceres was a planet for about 50 years, too. We just don't remember it because it was from 1800 to 1850, a long time ago. And it was demoted because, um, because we discovered the asteroid belt. And we know and love the asteroid belt. So I like to think that we didn't lose a planet, we gained a belt. 
<laughs> and this is actually a really interesting build um, for many reasons. It's uh, enough for another talk, but I just want to tell you one reason because it's related to what we've been talking about. And that is um, that we're going to look at the red Kuiper belt objects and the white ones. So the red ones go in a whole circle around the sun. Actually, there's a gap here, but that's just because the galaxy is here. So we can't look here. There are too many stars confusing um, the sky. So the red ones go in a whole circle. But these white ones, if you see where Neptune is, there are no white ones near Neptune, and there are no white ones opposite Neptune. They're only to the sides. These are called um, resonant objects. They're called Plutinos, because Pluto is one of these. Um, and they go around the sun twice for every three times that Neptune goes around. And um, if you just threw a bunch of stuff out into the outer solar system, you would not expect to see all of these Plutinos. They're in a very special configuration. And you know, from, from doing some, some very detailed dynamical analysis of how those objects could have gotten to where they are, uh, we as a field have concluded that they got there because Neptune pushed them there as it moved from where it formed much closer to the sun. Now, this is an active area of research. There's much debate about exactly what way Neptune moved out and captured those objects. But we're pretty sure that this happened. So, uh, so even our own solar system, in our own solar system, our planets moved. The, the universe is a much more dynamic place than we thought which is a lot of fun. All right. So why are Jupiter and Mars so different? Well, what we said is that Mars, Earth, and the other terrestrial planets grew too slowly and never became big enough to accrete gas from their birth disk. So Mars is just a tiny rock. But Jupiter, it has a tiny rock in the middle, but it's mostly made of gas. Now, I should say, though, that um, while the majority of astronomers believe this to be true, there is actually um, a credible alternative, and that is that Jupiter actually has no core in the middle. It just collapsed from the gas, much like a star. And you'd think that we couldn't actually tell, because it's buried so deep in there, but it turns out that NASA's Juno spacecraft, which will arrive at Jupiter in 2016, um, can actually measure whether there's a core in the middle. And the way that it's going to do that is it's going to put a spacecraft in orbit around the planet and measure how different the gravity is compared to what you would expect um, if this planet were just a single point. And it's an extended planet, and whether it has a core or not, inside there will affect the way that spacecraft orbits. Now, as you might imagine, it's a tiny effect, so you have to have very sensitive instruments to measure this. But that's one of the major goals of this mission. So, uh, so stay tuned. Um, and when Juno gets to Jupiter, you can look in the news and see if they've found a core. And if they haven't, then you'll know that a lot of us uh, will need to be scratching our heads and thinking about why we all agreed that this planet was formed uh, by core accretion. This is the name of the, the model that I, that I told you about. All right. So we can look forward to that. Um, and, uh, and I'd like to end here with, uh, with a coda about Jupiter uh, and, and its moons. Here we have a picture of Jupiter in the middle. And it's four Galilean satellites um, in a line. They're called the Galilean satellites because Galileo was able to see them with his new telescope. Uh, and he actually saw them orbiting around Jupiter, which was, which was quite unexpected, right? Because uh, you know, Galileo was after Copernicus, but there were still many people who believed that everything should be orbiting around the Earth. And the one thing that I'd like you to look at here is the fact that these uh, satellites are all in a straight line. Why is that? Disc. Disc. Can you elaborate? 
What what about a disc? Jupiter had its own small smaller disc going around itself. Exactly. And they and they exactly. Jupiter had its own uh, small disc <laughs> orbiting around um, itself as it formed, and these moons condensed out of it in just the same way that we said the rocky planets condensed out of the disk orbiting the sun. Let's look at this one here, the biggest one, third from Jupiter. There's Ganymede. This is to scale. It's basically the same size as Mars. They're both rocky planets. They actually look very similar. So when I look at this uh, image as a planet formation theorist, you know, one thing that really strikes me is the fact that Jupiter in the middle with these moons around it um, looks almost like a star. I mean, it's made of hydrogen and helium, much like the sun is made of hydrogen and helium. It has rocky moons, planets, moons, you know, orbiting around it, much the same way that the sun has rocky planets. And, uh, you know, the only real difference, other than the fact that Jupiter is, you know, orbiting the sun, is that it's, it's just a little small. <laughs> so it's not, um, you know, fusing hydrogen in its core. It's not, it's not heavy enough to start nuclear fusion in its interior. And the reason that this is important um, to me uh, in my own personal work is that um, we're now starting to be able to actually take pictures of planets around other stars. And the first planets that we're finding are very massive, a little bit bigger than Jupiter, very far from their stars. And it's actually tricky to tell them apart from little stars. And I don't think the situation is going to get better. In the coming years, uh, direct imaging of planets is going to, to yield a lot more objects. And you know, if I can speculate a little bit, I expect that it's going to start being very ambiguous where planets end and stars begin. So I hope that if that happens, and we have to revise our definition of a planet yet again, and we lose some planets here or there because of it, that you won't see it as losing a planet, but instead you'll see it as gaining a, well, I don't really know actually because that's the point, right? Whatever we find, we'll have gained. And we'll, that means that we'll understand a little more about what's out there and you know, where we are and how we and our planets uh, fit in. So, uh, so here we are, Jupiter and Mars. Um, I've talked about their differences and how those differences likely came about from their formation in a disk of gas and dust around a young star. I've talked a little faster than I intended to, so there's plenty of time for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Clay. Now we'll take some questions before, guess what? The sky has completely cleared up. So we'll get a chance to see Jupiter and Mars in just a few moments. But questions first, and we'll start on this right over here. Um, about this business of the line not being so clear, are there binary stars that develop from the same disk? Do you believe that that's possible? That's a fantastic question. There are many binary stars. In fact, um, it may be the case that almost all stars uh, form in binaries, including possibly our own sun and then are um, dynamically separated at birth. Certainly high mass stars are often found in multiples, not just binaries, but also in triples um, and, and quadruples. And um, the difference, the but uh, yeah, no, here's the difference. Right? When we see multiple stellar systems, they don't usually look like a star with objects that formed in a disk orbiting around them. Instead, you'll have one object and another, and if you have a triple, there will be a third one orbiting over here, and then the whole thing will be orbiting the middle. It doesn't look like a disk. We call it hierarchical 
And we think what happens is in those young star forming regions, just two bits of gas happen to collapse near each other. So the difference with directly imaged planets is we're seeing multiples of these on concentric circular orbits that look like they form in a disk. So we can call them planets, but actually many times that, that sort of formation scenario might produce brown dwarfs, little stars. And that will be the new population part. We have a question from over here. Question I saw an arm in the back, please. Yeah, uh, the Galilean moons, how they in a straight line. I know Jupiter has more than four moons. Okay, yeah. 60. Are they all in that straight line? That's a fantastic question. No, they're not. Actually, a large number of those moons are in a big cloud at larger distances from Jupiter. So we think that you know those four formed in a disk, but then many of the other more distant moons were just dynamically captured later. Like the two moons of Mars were captured. They're not round also. They were just passing by and never left. <laughs> Question. Exactly. <laughs> yes. If Jupiter is a star, we would gain the planet Ganymede. So there are actually a number of uh, you know, people who seriously think that what we should do is we should give planets names based on what they are. Mars and Ganymede are the same thing. They should be called the same thing. Question right here. Mm -hmm. I mean, can, can you call something that doesn't have fusion going on inside of it a star, though? It depends. I mean, can you? I yeah. <laughs> you can do whatever you want, right? Um, but, but more seriously, you know, if you were going to, to go along with what I just said and say that Mars and Ganymede are the same thing, mm -hmm. so they should be called the same thing, then it, it's perfectly sensible to say that if something is not fusing material in its, sense, in its center, then it's not a star. Mm -hmm. But Jupiter is still not the same thing as Mars, so then we have to come up with another name. Mm -hmm. To add to that, there is radiation coming out of Jupiter, and that's one of the reasons why humans probably will never walk on the surface of any of the Galilean moons. They'll get fried with all of the radiation that comes, and when we look for life on these moons, we're going to look under the ice inside because everything on the surface has been marvelously radiated by Jupiter. So in many ways, Jupiter does look more like a star than a planet. That's right. In addition to the, the frying radiation, just the half of the brightness of Jupiter is coming from its, its contraction. That's right. Question up here. Um, I saw on the internet recently that they, um, they think they may have seen um, a moon developing in Saturn's ring. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of very small moons uh, in Saturn's rings. Um, yeah. So then why, why is a ring particle not a moon? Because there are a lot of them. <laughs> would that would that mean that Saturn's ring is similar to the disks that you know were were around Jupiter at one time? Absolutely, um, and the disk that was around the Sun. So you remember, I showed that movie of a planet migrating toward its star because it's interacting with the disk. We can actually see little moonlets interacting with Saturn's rings in just that same way. Which brings up an interesting question. How many planets in our solar system have rings? Four. How many vote for one? Saturn. How many vote for two? Three. Do I hear three? Give me three, three. I need four. Give me four. Four. <laughs> what are the planets with rings around them? Jupiter and Saturn. Neptune and Uranus. And we just found an asteroid with rings around it. Yeah. <laughs> rings are a little more common than we thought. <laughs> all right, another question. Anybody? Yes? Why is it, with all the technology we have, we're looking at planets around distant stars, and we can tell a lot about them. Why are we still confused about Jupiter as whether or not it has a core? Well, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, Jupiter uh, is not... If Jupiter has a core then its core is going to be less than about five times the mass of the Earth. Um, Jupiter itself is 300 times the mass of the Earth. So one answer is that it's just this tiny little thing inside the planet. It doesn't change the planet's size at all. Uh, it, you know, it doesn't really matter whether there's a core in there for the easiest things to observe. The only real way that we can tell is to put a spacecraft around it and measure those very subtle changes and the gravitational force that the spacecraft feels. 
Do you know what the difference between size and mass is? Scientists work with mass. A styrofoam ball has very little mass. A lead ball has a lot of mass, and that is how we make the measurements. So she keeps referring to mass. We don't use it in our in our vernacular very often. We don't go out and buy a car and say, wow, that looks like a massive car. <laughs> I want to get some massive clothes today. <laughs> that food was massive sometimes. But it's a term, and, and I'm just curious sometimes if you understand what that term is relating to in the mass of a planet compared to another one. And that's how we do it. Sometimes we are uh, use them a little bit interchangeably because yeah. the, the factor between your size and your mass ranges between maybe one and five. It changes. So it's, it's, it changes enough that it matters to us when we're doing our science, but it's still not a huge difference. Not a massive difference. Not a massive difference. <laughs> <laughs> <Not a massive. laughs> so, question about, again, to the core. If it's solid within gas, why can't we use something like radar? You know, and bounce radar images off the core. That's a that's a great question. Um, it's because there's just so much gas there that the radar will will hit the gas. I mean, this really is a humongous ball of gas. You know, with a with a pebble on the inside. Yeah. And Earth is not a pebble, but to Jupiter it is. So um, so we can't see uh, very far into the atmosphere of Jupiter. You know if different frequencies might work or different power or something. So different frequencies will go to different depths. Um, so we can see much deeper using radar than we could with light that we can see with our eyes. But it's still not anywhere close to the core. One more question. Did we have one more question? I thought I saw one in the back. Up above? Up above. Up above, our last question. Uh, we talked about the moons of Jupiter, the moons of Mars. What about the moon? Wow. Yeah. Oh, good question. So the moon, um, we think, uh, was formed in a very different way, and that is uh, in, a, in a major collision with the Earth. Not from a disk that, well, actually, when the moon collided with the Earth, it became molten and then formed its own molten disk around the Earth, which then reaccreted into the moon, probably. But the point is that it wasn't like a, it wasn't a, it wasn't this sort of gas and dust disk that we were talking about for the hydrogen and helium balls, uh, like Jupiter and the Sun, and um, the difference really is really is that it's if you have a lot of hydrogen and helium uh, in you, then you need to have a disk to get all of that gas onto you, and that's because you need to uh, to uh, you know to get over the the pizza problem. <laughs> Thank you for joining us tonight.